You know, sometimes people say Christians are so self-righteous. They're so pleased with themselves. But you could not be further from the truth because a genuine Christian is only a Christian on the grounds that he knows his own unrighteousness, our failure, our sin, and we come in honesty and we confess it. It is the self-righteous who don't need Christ. And when someone who purports to be a Christian parades this kind of self-righteousness, they haven't begun to understand the Christian life. They've just adopted a Christian religion. Now 
In Paul's beloved book, Romans, he makes some tough, unashamed statements about salvation, God's sovereignty, judgment, and God's righteousness. Paul wrote the letter to the Romans as a foundation for their faith. Righteousness is the moral character of God. So how's your character? Today's message is called, The Experience of Justification by Faith. Let me read you from Romans chapter 4. We've been looking into the book of Romans for a number of weeks. And I'm going to read from verse 1. It comes in the middle of Paul talking about the fact that Christ has addressed and satisfied the justice of God. And on the basis of that, a man or woman may be justified by faith. And then in chapter 4, he illustrates what that means by talking about Abraham. And he says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to a man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Down to verse 16. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered of the death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Any first-time reader of the New Testament if they were to observe very carefully the recurring themes as they read it through, would realize very quickly that a key component in the whole message is that we need to exercise faith. They would discover that the New Testament tells us that we are cleansed by faith, we are justified by faith, we are saved by faith, and then having become a Christian on the grounds of faith, we are to walk by faith, we are to live by faith, we are sanctified by faith, we fight the fight of faith, we take the shield of faith, we overcome the world by faith, we ask in faith, we have access to God by faith, we draw near in full assurance of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whatever is not of faith is sin. These are just some of the references in the New Testament to this word faith. But the question is, what is meant by this? What actually does it mean to exercise faith? How does it operate? Well, here in Romans 4, Paul is writing about how the work of Jesus Christ for us becomes operational and experiential in us. And he uses the example of Abraham to illustrate that as Abraham was justified by faith, whatever that means, that we also are justified by faith, that as God's 
righteousness was credited to Abraham, not on the basis of any deserving nature within himself, but as a gift. So God's righteousness, that is our standing before God, is credited to us, not on the basis of any performance within ourselves. We've already seen in these early chapters of Romans that the key theme that reoccurs in the book is the righteousness of God, the moral character of God. 44 times that word is used in this letter. But having introduced that wonderful theme, he then talks about the wrath of God and how the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven and it is being revealed in God handing people over to the natural end result of their own willful disobedience. And we talked about that. But that is not the sole nature of his wrath. It is also that there is going to come a day of judgment when men and women will stand before God accountable for everything that they have been. That's in chapter 2 and 3. And when you get to the middle of chapter 3, it is easy to become very depressed and very discouraged because Paul affirms there's no one righteous, that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. There is no one who seeks God. There's no one who does what is good. You think, man alive, this is a terrible situation being described here. And having gone to the, if you like, the blackest hole in the middle of chapter 3, he then says in verse 21, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. And we looked at this last time where he talks about the fact that Jesus Christ on the cross addressed and fully satisfied the judgment of God that in place of judgment being experienced by you and me, we are in total contrast declared Justified, meaning the demands of the law were fully met in Jesus Christ so you and I can be made free. Now, that's a wonderful truth. It is, in some senses, a legal transaction that has taken place. The justice of God has been addressed and satisfied. And the word justified is a legal term. But this is something far more than simply a legal transaction. This has to become experiential in our lives. And it becomes experiential on the basis of faith, which is what Romans 4 is telling us from the example of Abraham. Now, I want to look at two aspects with you this morning. I want to look in the first 16 verses at righteousness as a legal transaction. So we're absolutely clear about that. And then from verse 17 to 25, I want to look at righteousness as a living transformation. It's not just my standing before God that has changed, but my experience of God and my experience of life is changed as well. Let's talk then, first of all, about righteousness as a legal transaction. And Paul presents this in these verses as an instantaneous change of position that takes place at a particular moment in a person's life. Look at what he says about Abraham in verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. There you are. The whole transaction is done. He believed God and the response it was credited to him as righteousness. As simple and as instantaneous as that. Now, of course, that's not the whole story. There are 25 verses to go yet in which he explains how this works out in the process of living. And it's important to know that. But it is important to know that it has a beginning, a moment when a man, a woman, a boy or girl recognizes that my standing before God has changed from what it was 10 minutes ago to something totally different on the basis of my response to the work of Christ. Let me explain the situation that he's using as an illustration. God had taken Abraham from a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, which is down in present-day Iraq. He'd taken him across to Canaan, which is present-day Israel. On the way, they got stuck in a place called Haran, where they got bogged down for a while. And when Abraham eventually got to Canaan, he was 75 years of age. His wife, who was with him, was 65 years of age. Her name was Sarah. 
They had no children. And it explains to us in Genesis, the reason for that is because Sarah was barren. When they got there, God took Abraham out one night and said, look up into the sky, how many stars can you see? I'm going to give you as many descendants as the stars you see in the sky. I'm going to give you a son from that son will come a nation, and from that nation, the seed of Abraham will come a Messiah who is going to bless the means of blessing the whole world. God told that to Abraham, and when he did, it says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. What God told Abraham was something which was humanly impossible. Not only was his wife barren, but she's now 65. She's long past the menopause. All her possible childbearing days are over and past. They've been married for donkey's years. They have no children. God speaks of what seems to be a ridiculously impossible situation. And Abraham's response is to say, I believe you. And on the grounds of that, he believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. When it says he believed God, what it means is this. Abraham said, God said it, God will do it. I can contribute nothing, really. My wife cannot because we're past the normal ages. God will do it. Well, after that encounter, he went home with a skip in his 75-year-old step, <laughs> all excited. We're going to have a baby. And the reason I know that is because God said it. And when God says something, he will do it. I trust him. And Abraham's focus is not on, well, how are we going to manage this? Sarah is barren. You know, we're old anyway. But his focus is on God entirely, what God has said, what God has promised. His focus is exclusively, absolutely, entirely, 100%. This is God's business. Now, this is the grounds on which a man or woman is justified before God. When God speaks about uh, standing before him as righteous, we know that is a ridiculously impossible thing. How do we know that? Because just look at the last seven days. Look at the kind of things we battle with. Look at the things we struggle with. Look at the temptations that come into our minds. Look at our histories. How is God going to declare that? Well, on the basis of his word, and all Abraham had was his word, this is not going to be something earned or deserved, but received as a gift. And Paul explains this further by saying in verse 4, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So what he's saying is that when a man works, his wages are not considered a gift. That would be the height of insult, wouldn't it? If a, if a man has worked hard for a day or for a week or for a month, at the end of the day or the week or the month, his boss comes to him and says, hey, I'd like to give you a gift, and he gives him the money that he has earned, he would say, this is not a gift. You're insulting me by calling this a gift. This is an obligation that you have. But says Paul, if a man has done nothing, he's done no work, he's made no contribution, then there, and there are no obligations between them, and then the boss comes and gives him some money, it is a gift. Unearned, undeserved, and unwarranted. And Paul is saying, don't ever get the idea that salvation is a little bit of what God does, a little bit of what I do, and somehow, you know, God weighs it in the balances and says, yes, I think you deserve this. I'm going to give this to you. No. You don't earn it. You cannot earn it. You simply say, you said it. You will do it. As Abraham had done. 
And he goes on, if you read in verse 10 to 12, that Abraham was not justified because of his circumcision, that is, in obedience to what God had told him to do. Nor in verse 13 to 15 was he justified because he had kept the law. But as verse 16 says, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. In other words, God initiates this. It's by grace. We receive it, for it is by faith. And our role is simply the role of receiving it. Now, I'll tell you why this is important. A lot of us get discouraged, sometimes get depressed about our salvation, because we're always looking inside to find whether we really deserve this and whether we're worthy of this or not. And when we look inside to find our worthiness, we discover we are constantly faced with our unworthiness, and we get discouraged. But this has nothing to do with your worthiness, nothing to do with that. You know, sometimes people say Christians are so self-righteous. They're so pleased with themselves. But you could not be further from the truth because a genuine Christian is only a Christian on the grounds that he knows his own unrighteousness or her own unrighteousness, our failure, our sin, and we come in honesty and we confess it. It is the self-righteous who don't need Christ. So actually, the reason why a person is not a believer is because they are self-righteous. It is not the believer who's self-righteous. And when someone who purports to be a Christian parades this kind of self-righteousness, they haven't begun to understand the Christian life. They've just adopted a Christian religion. It is on the basis of our brokenness and our failure. And in Romans 3... Paul talks about the fact that all our sin was placed on Christ. So in chapter 4, he can talk about all Christ's righteousness has been placed on us. Let me illustrate that. If this yellow package in my hand represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ and this purple package in my left hand represents the sinfulness of human beings, of you and of me. What happened in Romans chapter 3 when Jesus Christ addressed and satisfied the judgment of God was that all of my sin was placed on him and when the father looked at the son, he saw him covered in my sin. All the sinfulness of human beings was attributed to Christ. He knew no sin was made to be sin for us. That's Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 4, you have the reverse effect where all the righteousness of Christ was placed upon me. So God looking at me sees not me, but sees Christ, sees his righteousness. And this is now my standing before God as once Christ on the cross, his standing before God was that he was a sinner. Not his own sin, but yours and mine. And this is the legal transaction made possible by the cross that makes possible and effective your justification and my justification. God, I don't deserve this at all. This is by grace. That is, you initiated it. It is by faith. That is, I receive it. And both have to take place. We have to consciously, deliberately say, thank you, Lord Jesus. I confess my need to you. And he comes by his Holy Spirit to live within your life. But our relationship with God is more than just a legal one where, okay, I'm declared righteous. And so my second point to look at is as righteousness as a living transformation. Not just a legal transaction, but a living transformation transformation that is taking place. Let me read you verse 17, Romans 4. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. That was the bit that Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness at that point. And he goes on to say, 
that he, Abraham, is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Now, why does Paul write this? That the God he trusts is the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. I'll tell you why. When Abraham believed God and it was credited him as righteousness, he was out at night, God speaking to him on his own, but he then had to come home and tell his wife, Sarah. God didn't tell Sarah. Abraham had to tell Sarah. This is momentous news for a woman to get, you know. And the Bible is not complimentary about either one of them. It says in verse 19 here that about Abraham, his body was as good as dead. So he wasn't healthy. (laughs) He's as good as dead. And then it says, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. In Genesis 18, it says about Sarah that she was worn out. I don't know why, because she had no kids, but she was worn out. (laughs) I don't know what she'd been doing. A lot of potato picking or something. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall when Abraham came home. Here's Sarah, all worn out, lying down there somewhere, and Abraham comes in, as good as dead. Sarah, God spoke to me. (laughs) Really, I'm glad you're having your devotion. What did he say to you? He's going to give us something. (laughs) What's he going to give us? You'll never guess. <laughs> He's going to give us a baby. And you know the remarkable thing? She believed him. I don't think my wife would believe me in similar circumstances. <laughs> I think she'd want a second opinion at least. <laughs> but she believed him, and she probably started painting the room or whatever women do when they get that information, and waited. Abraham would say, how are you feeling, Sarah? you putting on weight at all? No. You been sick in the mornings? No. Three months go by, six months go by. Are you sure you're not putting any weight? You're not eating funny combinations like bananas and onions at the same time? No. Nine months go by. There should be a baby somewhere close. Well, come on, Sarah, are you sure nothing's going on? 12 months went by, two years went by, three years, five years, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, 24 years before God spoke to him again, and 25 years before they had the baby. They did have a crisis after 10 years. It's in Genesis 16. They had a a blazing row, Abraham and Sarah. She said to him, in effect, if I can paraphrase it, did you tell me 10 years ago that God told you? Did you tell me 10 years ago that God told you we're going to have a baby? (laughs) Well, yes, he did. I didn't make that up. God told me that. You sure it was God? Yeah, well, yes. You sure? What have you been eating that night? You've been eating too much curry or something? No, no, it wasn't the curry. God told me. Well, where's the baby, Abraham? Well, Sarah, sorry to mention this. Maybe God didn't realize how, how worn out you were. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Abraham, maybe God didn't realize how dead you are. <laughs> but there's no baby. So they devise a scheme. They committed themselves to bring about the will of God by their own scheming. That is always a disastrous thing to do. You let God bring about his will. And they decided, in the context of the culture of the day, we have a maid called Hagar. She's young, she's single, she's probably fertile. Why don't you have the baby through Hagar? Incidentally, Abraham and Sarah had gone to Egypt in disobedience out of the will of God and Hagar was an Egyptian maid they brought back with them. Let me warn you, when you step out of the will of God, you always bring back 
baggage. You need to clean up and clear up. And here's Hagar. And she conceives Abraham's child and gives birth to a little boy. And they called him Ishmael. And Abraham must have been thrilled a bit. At last, I got this little boy. 85, I'm a bit old. Could be his grandfather, could be his great grandfather, just about. But I thank you anyway. And Ishmael grew up. And then 13 years later, when Abraham was 99, God said, Remember I spoke to you about your wife giving birth to a son? Well, yes. Well, this time next year, your wife will give birth to a son. Beg your pardon? <laughs> this time next year, your wife will give birth to a son. But well, we got him. He's 13 already. I mean, he's, he's a strapping young man. He's, look, he's out there playing volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually says in Genesis 21 that Sarah gave birth on the very day God had said. Now, Paul misses out that bit about Ishmael. And the fact, by the way, that when God told him in 99 he was going to have this, this son next year, he laughed. And then he went home and told Sarah, and she laughed. But Isaac was born. Now, Paul... It's very kind about Abraham. He doesn't talk about the fact that they produced Ishmael here in Romans chapter 4. He just talks about the process that went on from the moment Abraham was declared justified to the moment that the issue over which he had believed God came to fulfillment, which was 25 years before he was born. And of course, that wasn't the fulfillment. The fulfillment was that beyond that would come a family and a nation. So how did Abraham survive for those years? And the reason why I asked that question, the reason why Paul asked that question, is because you might have come to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, I, I do trust you. You died for me. You were buried for me. You raised, were raised again from the dead. And I, I invite you to forgive me and cleanse me on the basis of your death and to come by your Holy Spirit to live within me. And, and you're born again of the Holy Spirit. And a transaction takes place. But you wonder, why in the world doesn't this work out a lot more easier than it seems to? Why aren't I seeing evidences of, uh, of real change in my life when sometimes it seems such a struggle? Well, Abraham is an illustration of this. And I love in verse 18 where it says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Well, how does Abraham believe in hope against all hope? <laughs> well, it sounds like, you know, this, this balancing thing, like a set of scales, where, where on the one hand, you know, he, he, is, he is full of hope, and so, so, so he, he's becoming confident and saying, he wakes up in the morning, yeah, God made me a promise, he's going to bring about it, and I'm full of hope. And then, you know, a year later, nothing is happening, and against hope, and his hope sinks, and his no hope rises, and then he has a good day, and his hope begins to rise again, and then he looks at the reality, and his no hope begins to rise again, and then he remembers what God said, and this was the word of God to me. God said it, so his hope rises, and he comes home and looks at Sarah, and she's all worn out, lying on a beanbag, with a, she's, a woman's dead, and he's almost dead anyway, and, and he has no hope. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like that about your own Christian life? You might go home on a Sunday full of hope. I heard something from the Word of God that encouraged me. Great, but Monday morning you're smack back down in discouragement again. This is an issue of faith in God that Paul is talking about. So the big question is, what kind of God... Is Abraham trusting? What is it that keeps his hope coming back and then the realities make his no hope begin to dominate his thinking and his feeling? Well, let me read you verse 17. And the uh, middle of verse 17, and he says two things there. He says, Abraham 
is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead. Oh, oh, hold on. The God who gives life to the dead. What is Abraham's problem? Well, go two verses later to verse 19. It says, Abraham's body was as good as dead. Go later in the same verse 19. And Sarah's womb was also dead. So here's the problem. Abraham's body is as good as dead. Sarah's womb is dead. They've got this incredible promise. It doesn't make sense in the light of their deadness. What kind of God is talking to us about this? And here's the answer. The God who gives life to the dead. The very thing that is my problem, God is the antithesis of. I'm dead, my wife's womb is dead. I'm as good as dead, her womb is dead. But what God is making this promise? What God am I trusting? It's the God who gives life to the dead. So my confidence is not in the increasing deadness of my own body or the deadness of my wife's womb. My confidence is in that the God I'm trusting is the God who gives life to the dead. So if I am nearly dead and her womb is dead, it is irrelevant to the final outcome. What is relevant to the final outcome is the God who said it, and the God who will do it is the God who gives life to the dead. Death is not a problem to him. It's where he imparts life. That was the ground of his confidence, first of all, during the times of waiting. When his hope was, was sinking, and the, the no hope was dominating, he said, what, what God am I trusting? A God who gives life to the dead. Wow, that's me, that's her. And the second thing he says in this verse 17, speaks of the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. That's an interesting statement. Things that are not, he calls them as though they were. God has talked about the future, and he's talked about babies and families and grandchildren and a tribe and a nation. None of these exist. None of these look likely to exist humanly, but God calls things that are not our son, grandchildren, tribe, nation, as though they are. You see, we are limited by this process that we call time. Time is a linear process. It has a beginning, it moves. In fact, science tells us that time did not exist before the existence of the world. Outside of the existence of the world, it was timeless. In other words, eternal. Scripture tells us that too. And we live within a process of time, but God lives in eternity, inhabits eternity. He stands outside of time. In the era of time in which you and I live, the future hasn't happened yet. But as far as God is concerned, he calls things that are not as though they were. And when God speaks of the future, he isn't guessing. He's been there. He knows He's seen it. And that's why when God speaks of things outside of our experience, when we read the word of God and we read things that are to be true of Christian believers, and we say, is that really true? Can I really trust that? He's been there. He knows that he sees it. It just hasn't happened yet in the linear process of time that we're part of. And so Abraham lives with this trust in a God who brings life to the dead. The problem is he is surrounded by deadness and a God who calls things that are not as though they were. And there's so much that God has said that is not, and yet God is speaking of them as though they were. And that's because he knows what I don't know. And so that's why in chapter 4, verse 18, he says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. In verse 19, without weakening in his faith. Verse 20, he did not waver through unbelief. Paul is being very kind to Abraham at that point, but as a big picture, 
He did not waver through unbelief. Verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had the ability to do what he had promised. And that, of course, is the issue. That is the ground on which we can be certain in this process of God working out his justification and sanctification, the things that make us Christ-like in our lives, is that we are fully persuaded that God has the ability to do what he has promised. He initiated it. It's by grace. He promised it. It is also by faith, so I receive it. How do I receive it? I'm persuaded God has the ability to do what God promised. That's what Paul says about Abraham. And I ask you this morning, do you? Do you believe God has the ability to do what he's promised? You know, we go through life and we fail. Then we fail again, and then again, and 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 again. And you and I have a track record of saying, oh, Lord, if you were to measure me by my consistency, man, I wouldn't have much of a chance. So what are we measured by? By our trust in the God who has the ability to do what he's promised. That's why this is not something deserved because of what I have done. It is undeserved. Lord, I trust you. I trust you. There'll be many of us here who are frustrated in our own Christian lives. But get your focus back on God himself. Get your focus back on his word, which we now have, not in a dialogue under the stars that Abraham had, but we have it now in this book, the word of God, which is to you and to me as his truth, full of his promises, full of his commitments. And because Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised, it was credited to him as righteousness. An ongoing daily growth in righteousness and quality of living. As I finish, is the God you trust, the God who gives life to the dead, and you feel, I'm so dead in these areas. Is the God you trust, the God who calls things that are not as though they were? So it hasn't happened yet in our experience of time, but God sees it and calls it, I trust him. It's the God you trust, the God who has the power to do what he promised. This was Abraham's God. And this justification by faith is a legal transaction. There is a moment in which we are declared right before God, but it's not only that, it has to become a living transformation because once you're right, as Abraham was, the ongoing day by day, trusting him, looking to him, experiencing him, waiting for him. Hope against hope. And it's hope that won. And this becomes the experience of every day which causes our standing before God, our righteousness, which is imputed to us to become our living before God and before the world, righteousness imparted as we trust him. Don't worry about failing. Don't worry about the fact you've got to confess your sins. You're going to have to do that. You're not going to be perfect, but you keep your eyes on him. And there are those of us here this morning, some of us need to enter into that moment of saying, Lord, I trust you, and you're declared right with God. Others of us, you've been a Christian for many years, maybe you're a recent one, but you need to go on saying, Lord, I'm not looking at myself because I'm discouraged by that. I am looking out to you, and you are committed. You are committed that I am conformed increasingly from one degree of glory to another into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're committed to making that true for me. And I trust you. 
even Jesus as Christ, his son. Give thanks with a great love. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he is given Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus Christ. 